I asked this question to quite a few people this week just to get the very first thing that came to their mind, the very first image or picture, and I asked them not to think real hard, but just to give me an answer. And I said, what do you see when I say the word church? And it was interesting, uh, several of these people had been Christians for a long, long time, knew the Bible very well, and one said steeple, another one said building, another one said people. You get all kinds of images and pictures, some good, maybe some bad, when you think of the word church. But, but there are some very distinct biblical pictures that you see in the Scripture. One of them would be that of a bride. Jesus is the groom, and the church is the bride. And when you, when you think of that image, it brings up all kinds of responsibilities as well as benefits and things that go along with that bride and the groom. Another picture that comes to mind is, is a flock of sheep, and Christ is the, the, the good shepherd. Uh, you're that black one right there in the back. Uh, that's you and me. But that, that's a picture of, of, of the church, that Jesus is the good shepherd, and he's, he's leading the flock, he's caring for them, he's ministering to them, he goes after the one that gets lost. So you've got the bride, you've got the flock. Another biblical picture that, 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 that should come to our mind as we think about the church, not just a bride, not just a flock, but a temple. The, the, the scripture describes us as living stones, a, a temple, and Christ is the builder as well as he's the foundation and he's the cornerstone. So, so when you begin to think about the church, and instead of buildings and steeples and things like that, tr try to bring your heart and your mind into the scripture and think of some, some biblical pictures, some biblical examples. Another, obviously, a well-known one is the body, and Christ is the head, and, and we all have a different part that we play and participate in. So, so here's the question that I would also ask. Not only what do you think of or what comes to your mind when you hear the word church, but where do you fit in? What, what's your role? What's your part? You know, if three people get together who are Christians at Starbucks to have a little Bible study, is that the church? Is that my part? Is the church just Christians uh, getting together, hanging out, any place, any time? Would you define that as, as a church? And how does, well, how does Jesus see the church? You know, there's only two places in all four Gospels where Jesus mentions or uses the word church. One is in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. You, you know this one. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Matthew 16. 18. And you probably know the, the story that surrounds that verse. Jesus had taken his men up to Caesarea Philippi. It's, 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 it's kind of up near the headwaters of the Jordan River, had the privilege of being there many times. It's where the Jordan begins to make its way down through Israel. It's, it's on your way to Mount Hermon, one of the highest elevations there in Israel. And it's there where Jesus gathered his men, and many commentators would say he gave them a midterm exam. It was like halfway through his ministry. And there in that, that area up there by the Jordan headwaters, he, he asked them a question. It says in Matthew, when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, 
who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And some say that you're John the Baptist. Some Elijah, others Jeremiah are one of the prophets. And then he said, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, you're the Christ, which is the term for Messiah or anointed one, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I say to you, here's our verse 18, that you are Peter and on this rock I'll build my church, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Peter declares who Jesus is, not by rumor, not by his own intellect or even by observation, but Jesus says it's by divine revelation from God the Father. And Jesus says, upon this I'll build my church. The church Jesus is building refers to all those who believe and trust in Jesus as the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. So, it, so it, the church includes all Christians. He's not speaking about a local church like Coastline. He's speaking about a universal church at this point. He's not speaking about the Baptist, although I'll never forget one time I was in Bible college and I was doing prison ministry in a local county jail in Bartow County down near Lakeland. And I'd shared this message. And those were some of my first messages I'd ever given. I was in this cell block and all the, all the cells were like this in a long horizontal. And I stood in the middle and at the end I said, if anyone has a question, you know, put your hand out. I would love to talk to you. So this Elderly guy stuck his hand out. I said, oh, great. That's a question. Walked over, said, yes. He goes, what denomination are you? I said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm really just from a Bible. I didn't want to get into the whole denomination thing. I said, I, I'm really from a Bible college here locally, and we came to minister to you guys, and we come every week. And he goes, no, what denomination are you? I said, why does that matter? He goes, well, I'll tell you why it matters. He goes, when Jesus came to the Jordan River, who baptized him? He said, it wasn't John the Presbyterian. <laughs> then, then, then he goes, wasn't John the Methodist? And I'm going, oh, my gosh. He goes, it was John the Baptist. And I thought, boy, this guy is a Bible scholar. So, so he's not talking about denominations, local churches. All believers in every age and every place in all the world who believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior, the Messiah, the one true Son of God, in every age, Every time in all the world who've accepted him and believed in him, there, there's one church, Jesus says, and I will build it, he says. The church is built on the solid rock of Jesus Christ himself. Amen? That, that's where it's built. Peter, what you confessed came from God the Father. And it's upon this reality that I am the Messiah and the Son of God, the Anointed One, sent to save the world, that I will build my church. And here's the deal. The church stands on the solid foundation of Jesus Christ, the true Son of God. And Jesus says the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, now listen. You can't say that about all local churches, that the gates of hell will not prevail against it are all denominations. It seems as you look, as you see, as you watch it, some are losing their way, abandoning the Bible, embracing beliefs and cultural practices that are even forbidden in Scripture. And, and some situations you look at and you think, oh my gosh, the gates of hell have prevailed over this situation. Maybe it's not built on the true rock. But also, we know that any local church 
will be mixed with those who know and love Jesus and those who do not. Listen to this passage of Scripture. I'll just read it to you from the book of Matthew. It comes from chapter 13. He puts forth a parable. He says, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in a field, but while men slept, the enemy came. And he sowed tares among the wheat, and he went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, di- didn't you sow good seed in the field? How, how does it have these tares? He said, The enemy did this. Do you want us then to go and gather them? He said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you uproot the wheat. Let them grow together into the harvest, and at that time I will say to the reapers, Gather the tares, bind them in bundles, and burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. So in every group, every congregation, there are those who are weed and those who are tares, but we don't belong or are connected to Christ because we're a part of a church. We're part of a church because we belong and are connected to Christ, right? It's the other way around. We don't belong to Christ because we joined a church. We belong to the church because we belong to Christ. You don't ever get that backwards. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19, it says, Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands having this seal. The Lord knows those who are His, and let everyone who are His, or who names His name, depart from iniquity, or depart from that which you know is wrong. There is an outward expression of that inward reality that reveals itself in a life of repentance and turning from those things that you know are wrong. And God has outlined for us all through His Word those things that bring death to us and life to us, those things that are living by the flesh versus living by the Spirit. And if you continue to hold on to the lifestyle that you know is wicked or that you know is wrong, If you're not careful, you can live a life of deceiving yourself, fooling yourself. Well, I'm this, but in reality, living in a way that, well, that's not anything what he's called you to be. You don't want to live a life where you deceive yourself. But depart from those things, like we just read, that that you know are wicked. Instead of saying, well, I'm okay. I can do what I want to do. It's like the story, and maybe you've heard this story, of the captain of the ship who looked into the dark night, and he sees these faint lights and way off in the distance, and he tells his signalmen, send a message. Tell that person to alter their course 10 degrees south. Well, a return message comes immediately. No, you alter your course 10 degrees north. Oh, the captain was angry. Uh, He command has been ignored, so he sends a second message. Alter your course 10 degrees south. I'm the captain of this ship. My name is Randall Stone. Another message received after and says, make your course 10 degrees north. I'm seaman third class Rick Jones. Immediately, the captain sent a third message, knowing this would finally settle the issue. Alter your course 10 degrees south. I'm a battleship. The reply came back. Alter your course 10 degrees north. I'm a lighthouse. <laughs> See, here's the thing. In our crazy, dark mixed up world, there's all kinds of voices, even from within, trying to direct us or tell us what to do, where to go, how to live. But out of the dark, I believe, comes one voice that speaks with more truth, more clarity, and more authority than all the rest. And this is the voice of the light of the world that you and I should not ignore 
lest we be deceived by our own selves and our own self-importance. The Lord knows who are his. And depart from all those things you know that are evil. One day, the true followers of Jesus Christ will gather in heaven. One day, we'll stand shoulder to shoulder and together will cry out with one voice. And I want to read to you what the scripture says will happen at that time. Just listen to these words. After these things, I looked and beheld a great multitude that no one could even number of all nations of all tribes, of all peoples, of all tongues, of all denominations, of all political parties, standing before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes and with palm branches in their hands, which is always a symbol of victory, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne, to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne, and the elders, and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne, and they worshiped God, saying, Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. And then it goes on and says, For the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them. And lead them to living fountains of water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Isn't that awesome? That's where all the true believers will stand one day. And Jesus speaks of a universal church. And he says, that church will be built upon all those who know me. And all those who come to me. And all those who believe I'm the anointed Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God. And when you come to him, not not only does he forgive you and cleanse you, but he breathes his Holy Spirit into you and your life begins to change. And you want to depart from all those things that you know are wicked, that you know are wrong. Jesus speaks of this universal church that will one day be made up from all tribes, from all nations, from all tongues, and and, and, and that, that is so large that no one could even number them. Then he also speaks, and this is the second time he speaks in the Bible, about the local church. And he does so again in Matthew. Matthew chapter 18, in verse 15, he says, if your brother sins against you, this is Jesus talking, you go and tell him his fault between you and him alone by yourself. If he hears you, you've gained your brother. But if he will not hear you, then gossip to everyone you see. No, it doesn't say that. Take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, well, then tell it to the church. He's talking about probably the leaders. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen or someone who works for the IRS, a tax collector. There's obviously here not talking about the church universal, but a local church dealing with relationships, the body. You know, tonight there's supposed to be uh, this phenomena in the sky. It's a celestial body that we see at night all the time, and it won't look like this. It'll be a full moon, I hear, tonight. But, but what would you call this if you saw it in the sky? You'd call it a crescent moon, but you'd also, if you weren't thinking about crescent, you'd just call it what? The what? It's not a trick question. <laughs> the moon. We don't usually see a, a, something like that in the sky and go, oh, there's a piece of the moon, or there's a section of the moon. We, we look at it, and we say, oh, oh, look at the moon tonight. Look at it. The, the part that is visible is genuinely, certifiably moon. But there's more than the moon, and we know that, and it's united with all the rest of the moon. And the local church, if you will, is kind of like a crescent moon. It's the visible 
part of the church, but still not the whole church. It's just a section or sliver of it. So Jesus uses the church in the Bible two ways. First, all believers, every age, every time, every place. Second, a a local congregation of believers called out by God to worship, to love Him, to to, to gather together, and, and to be on mission together in our world. Now, God's people have always been in a relationship. God's people have always been in a relationship that He initiates. It starts with Him. All the way back, he's the one who created man. He's the one that created woman. He's the one that initiates relationship. He's the one that sets boundaries, and he's the one that gives us wisdom of how to live, what to eat, what not in the, in the garden. And he calls us to himself, and he, he starts this process. He, he's the initiator. He's the beginning. And... He's the end. He's the alpha. He's the omega. God is the one who who, who draws us to himself. And and it goes all the way back to Adam, all the way back to Abraham when he calls him out. and, And he begins to establish a picture. God, even through Moses, you see him calling his people. Come out of bondage. Come out of slavery. Come and worship me and hear my word. In fact, in Exodus chapter 7. It says, and you shall say to him, the Lord God of the Hebrews has sent me to you. This is God talking to Moses. Let my people go, let them come out of bondage, let them come out of slavery, that they may serve me in the wilderness. But indeed, until now, you would not hear. So so God has always been calling his people to himself, all the way back to the Old Testament. The, The word serve means to worship. God calls his people out of slavery, out of bondage, to follow and worship him. And this is what happens there in Egypt. You know the story. They trusted his promise. They they believed after all these plagues, the final plague was to come, and they they put the blood on their doorposts, on their door frames, and, and the angel of death passed over them. That's where we get the whole Passover meal and and. God brought them to the Red Sea, and then he parted it for them, and he took them to Mount Sinai where they would worship. And the great purpose of the Exodus was God gathering a people to himself who would worship him together. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 10, especially concerning the day you stood before the Lord your God in Horeb, when the Lord said to me, gather the people together. To me, I will let them hear my word, my words, that they may learn to fear, or the word there also could be revere or worship, that they may learn to revere me all the days they live on the earth and that they may teach their children. God calls people to himself. When, when the Old Testament was translated into Greek, The word used for gather is the word assemble. It's the Greek word ecclesia. It's the same word used to describe a gathering, a congregation. Now now, now just stay with me. The word literally means called out. And you can go all the way back in the Old Testament and see that from the very beginning, God began to call people out to be his. They were his called out ones. They're the ecclesia. That's the word for the church in the scripture. He calls the people out of bondage, out of slavery, out of their old life into a new life. He certainly did that for me. He called me out of my old life, out of my slavery to all kinds of things, bondage to all kinds of things, to love and worship, to hear his word, to revere or fear him. And the pattern began way back at the beginning when God began to form his people, Israel. All the way back to the time of Moses, called out of their old life for worship, for his word, and to be together in his presence. 
And he would also connect them. If you, if you go to uh, the book of Numbers, chapter 2, he puts them in tribes. And they all have different functions and involve. It, we're, we're not going to read Numbers 2 because we would be here a long, long time. But God put them in tribes, in groups, to build relationships, to build purpose, to, to build trust, to get to know each other, to, to, to hear each other's stories and their needs and to function together, to, to have some kind of sense of, of unity and, and, and to accomplish what one cannot accomplish by himself. I mean, tonight we're, we're having this, this meeting where we we're hoping to put our, our, our church body, this local church body, into tribes, so to speak, in groups. And people will host them and people will help lead them. And, and, it's, and, and it's those people that, that God have called out, out of slavery, out of bondage, to group them together with other believers so they might be able to share their story, share their purpose, and to connect with one another and help one another and grow together in Christ, the Son of the living God. That's what these groups are all about. I'll never forget one of my early uh, experiences. I was hosting a, a group. I hosted one last time in my house. I, I was hosting one many, many years ago, and I had this neighbor across the street. He wasn't a Christian, and I had a basketball goal. I would shoot baskets when I got home with my younger son, and um, he, would, he would drift over with his daughter, who was about the same age as my little boy, and he would shoot baskets with me. He'd bring his beer over. He'd set it at the foot of the thing. We'd shoot baskets. And um, one time after shooting some baskets, I said, hey, would you and your wife like to come over for dinner Saturday night? He goes, yeah, we'd love to do that. He lived right across the street. Came over for dinner. We were eating dinner. We're sitting there. And he looked at me with a weird look. And, and I thought, he goes, hey, I never asked you this question before. I go, what? He goes, what do you do? And I thought, oh, no. Here's where it happens. And he, I, I go, what do you think I do? He goes, I don't know. Do you sell insurance or something? What do you do? I said, well, I'm a pastor. And he, he decides, got real big. He goes, really? He goes, that's the last thing I would have expected. <laughs> I said, why? He goes, well, you seem kind of normal. <laughs> I said, well, that's a great compliment to me. And so that night, I shared the gospel. We're sitting there. Now they know I'm a pastor. Might as well do my job. So I asked a couple of questions. It led into a gospel presentation. At the end, I said, does that make sense? Would you like to receive the Lord? And he was very, like, rigid. His wife didn't seem that way, though. I said, well, you don't have to pray here. You can pray at home. You, you do it in the privacy of your own home. And, well, the next day, his wife came back over and talked to my wife and said, hey, I prayed that prayer. Ask Jesus into my heart. And she got radically, wonderfully saved. And they started coming to the group in my home. And later in that relationship, she contracted, or there was a reemergence in her life of ovarian cancer that I didn't know she'd ever had. And the night that she died, her, her daughter was spending the night at our house. And her husband, who had not become a believer at that time, but he, I asked him one time, I said, why are you coming to this group? You don't believe in Jesus. You seem to not want anything to do with him. He goes, I'm watching you guys. I'm watching you guys because you seem like you really care. So he called me from the hospital that night when his wife passed away. He asked, he said, how's my daughter? I said, how's your wife? Your daughter's fine. She's asleep. He goes, John, she just went to heaven. I said, oh, I'm so sorry. But that relationship with him continued. He, he, became a, he became a Christian. He became part of our group. And, and, and I say all this, that the reason I think he became one was not because I was a pastor and I lived across the street, because I was a part of a group of people that cared about him and prayed for him and helped him with his daughter and helped him with his situation. See, here's the thing. The gates of hell want to prevail against you and I from being a blessing, from being involved to help others, being accountable to grow. We, we, we all have a place in the body that we need to step into 
and be a part of and, and find ourselves ministering to others. We're called out. We're, we're called out to be a part. There was, maybe you've heard this story, there was an important job to be accomplished and everybody was asked to participate to get it done. This is a story about four people, everybody, anybody, somebody, and nobody. Everybody was sure somebody would do this important job. The job was such that anybody could have done it. The reality, however, was nobody did it. Somebody got angry about that because it was everybody's job. Everybody thought anybody could do it, but nobody realized that everybody wouldn't do it. So it ended up that everybody blamed somebody when nobody did what anybody could have accomplished. Sometimes that's the church. Well, those people, you know, they'll, they'll connect, they'll do. But, but you're called out, I'm called out to be part of a tribe, to worship the Lord, to connect together, and to serve. In Isaiah chapter 49, verse 6, it says, Indeed, he says, it is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also, is speaking to not just Abraham, but also to, not just to Isaiah, but also to you and I, that you be a light to the Gentiles, that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. We're called. I think some of the saddest people in the world and the most anxious people in the world and the most absorbed people in the world are those who never learn to serve or to share or to be a light. It's all about them. Jesus chooses this word, ecclesia, the called out ones. With all its background, Jesus, who knows the Old Testament, who, 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 who is brought up in that context, with all the, the, the meaning of the word, he says, I will build my ecclesia, my called out ones. I will build a community of people called out by God to worship, to be in tribes, to serve a visible local congregation of followers and believers in me, he says, who knows what it's like to put away the old life, to be delivered from bondage. So writing to the local church in the New Testament, the, the, the one he said this to, that I'll build my church, Peter writes these words, and they're, 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 they're powerful words in First Peter Chapter 2, he says, We come to him as a living stone, rejected and then indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also, as living stones, are being built into a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, is also contained in the scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes in him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he's precious. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone, a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense. They stumble being disobedient to the word to which they also were appointed. But you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness. He, he, he called you out. That's the word ecclesia. In his marvelous light you now stand, who once were not a people, but now the people of God, who have obtained mercy and now have obtained mercy. That, that's a powerful statement of what God has done, who we are. As a local church, you and I here in this community, we gather called out of our old lives to be a building together, stones fit together. I mean, called out of our bondage, our sin. I, I know I was. 
God came searching and looking and knocking, called to worship him, to begin to, to find out who he was by reading his word, to grow and to mature. mature. It's like Jesus said to his men. He, he says to you and I in John 20, he says, Peace to you, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. To be a light, to be one who brings healing to others. You don't become a part of the church by accident. God places you. God calls you out. God builds and gathers his church. It's not a self-selecting group. You know what I'm saying? Else, if it was, most of us wouldn't be here, right? If the church was like, well, we want to only want people like us. We wouldn't pick Hal sitting here. I mean, come on. God chooses. He places them here. And he says, hey, you are to be together like living stones. You and I would just choose people like us. The church is gathered by God, and he adds daily those who would be saved. And he brings them in. Let me ask you a question. Are you part of those called out? Are you part of those who've been brought out of your old life into a new life, and God brought you into the local church? Have you left your old life behind? That's one way to know if you're part of it. If you're still in your old life, you're just a church attender. Are you part of the living church? You've turned away from that which you know is wrong. You don't belong to Christ by being part of a church. You're part of a church because you belong to Christ. Amen? I mean, that's how it works. In 1983, we, we started a, a bunch of us. It wasn't just me, a, a church in the school. And we said, okay, Lord, uh, here we are. <laughs> we, don't, we don't really know what we're doing, but we know you do. And three of us met on the corner where this Harrison Avenue ends. It was all woods back here. We, we knelt down on this little piece of property, and we prayed, and we asked the Lord, Lord, is this the place where you want us to build a building for your people? And one of the guys in our group who was a very dear brother, he said, I believe God spoke to me and said, this is where God wants to build a place for people to come to know him to gather, to worship, to love God, to connect with one another, to be salt, to be light, to be on mission, to go out into our neighborhoods and our workplaces and our schools, to be a light in the darkness. You say, John, you don't work where I work. You don't know how dark it is where I live. Well, good, you make it lighter. Think how dark it would be without you. You make it brighter. One writer described the church like this. He said, I believe that the Son of God, through the Spirit and the Word, out of the entire human race, from the beginning of the world to its end, that He calls, that He gathers, that He sends, that He protects, and that He preserves for Himself a community chosen for eternal life and is united through faith. And of this community, he says, I am and always will be a living member of the church. That's who we are. And you and I have been called out for a purpose, to love him and to fear him and revere him and to worship him and to hear his word, and to be placed in tribes together, and to go into the world and share the gospel. And if there ever was a time that the world needed it desperately, in a world that's dark and confused and people grappling to figure out what the truth is, I, I, I believe that uh, where you find truth now is very difficult. I'm, I'm beginning to realize this is about the only place where it's not been diluted, are confused, and where the Holy Spirit can lead and guide us into all truth. 
So God has called you and I to be the church, the local church. It may not be Methodist or Presbyterian or the one and only church that John the Baptist saw, but we're his church. And I would encourage you to be a part of it. One way is to come tonight. If you want to be a part of that gathering, you can sign up up there. We have a, a, a room for 25 more people. I'd love to see that room full tonight. At least people saying, hey, I'd like to see what it means to host a group or serve that way or lead a group. See, here's the thing. That's what God's called you out to be, part of the church and a tribe. Not a, not a spectator, but somebody on the team. You and I have been called to be the local church together. And I believe we're more alive than ever when we function that way. A part of this community, a living body called out from our old life, just like Moses called the people out of bondage, to, to, to group them together, to fear God, to serve him, to take the land and be a light to the world. Thank God there's such a thing called the church, and we're not alone. Amen?